A quest is a search for something. And every week, the Quest podcast will show you how we know what we know through interviews with people that have incredible stories of dedication and perseverance. I'm your host, Todd Fisher. Join me in this thought-provoking and inspiring podcast of discovery. Find us anywhere you listen to podcasts. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a special episode of No Earthly Explanation. I'm the producer of the show, Todd Fisher, and with me is the host, the one and only Don Schmidt. Good evening, Todd. How are you? Good, good. So, you know, we wrapped the season already. It's over. Season two of No No Earthly Explanation is over, but we had to do a special episode because just last week we had congressional hearings and what what do I say? Is it bombshells, Don? Let's let's go right into this now. What's your impression of these hearings? Is this the same old, same old? Is this something new? Is this a confirmation? Give us give us your take. Well, first of all, I mean they build this and, and long awaited. I mean, we we knew this was um uh, in development now for over a year. And one of the things that we had pushed for for the last number of years is for immunity that potential whistleblowers would be able to testify under oath without fear of uh, government repercussion any reprise on the part of the government as a result of their speaking about sensitive matters and in this case ufos uaps is the the uh, the new label it seems like every time there is a new facet of ufo investigation uh, they, they give it a, a, a new title and what's been encouraging is that you have a number of congress people such as luna and Burchette and Grothman and, and gallagher and uh you've had aoc and even had chuck schumer now new york has even stepped in and uh suggesting as we have also as we have worked with Burchette's office Gallagher's office, and we are presently setting up meetings with Grothman's office. That what they should be the most appalled at is the fact that they too have been deceived. That the Pentagon has not been playing upfront and transparent with the very people who are their bosses. Now, what the audience has to always realize is that as it was established, beyond the initial militias through the continental United States, through the Revolutionary War, that once an actual federally funded military was established, an army and a navy, that they were still under civilian control. The point being that they would have to answer to civilian representatives lest they would potentially become a threat to the very people they were to serve and protect. So there were to be these gatekeepers, these people that would make sure that the military would always work within specific boundaries. Well, what you've had specifically since 1947, that the military has taken upon themselves to become this super secret, this covert body of military generals, other officers who have uh, managed to uh, you know, keep the lid on the UFO phenomenon. And here we are now going on 76 years and you have members of Congress, specifically this US House subcommittee that had the UAP hearings just a week ago and afforded three so-called whistleblowers to testify under oath and answer the questions from both houses, both the Democrats and Republicans. So that in itself was special, not only that you had whistleblowers who were granted immunity, but secondly, that you, you had something, you had an issue that was totally 
bipartisan that the Democrats were working, were agreeing with the Republicans and vice versa. And so that demonstrated a willingness to cooperate. And let's see where you know this line of questioning goes and see how, if anything, can be pried loose from the Pentagon. So uh, the obvious star of the hearings was the former officer, former Navy officer, David Grush, who became this whistleblower. He was first interviewed by 60 Minutes Australian CBS, Ross Coulter, who I had met when I had lectured in Sydney. Ross attended my lecture and it was pretty much his first taste of the subject matter. And he was rather intrigued by it. In fact, he would make the comment to me that he didn't realize the phenomenon was that extent that there was something that you could really sink your teeth in. And in my case, it was the Roswell incident. And so we established a a connection. We would Skype together. We would exchange emails. And I, at times, would voice my disapproval of his misrepresentation of Roswell. He doesn't get the facts always as correct as I would like, especially as a journalist should. But he was nonetheless the one who did the interview with David Grush on News Nation. And so this is where this all began. And the next thing we know, Grush is testifying behind closed doors. He's meeting as far as with members of Congress, and he's supposedly divulging not only the names of his sources, but also where he's been told there is physical evidence. Now, I would have never predicted that there would be hearings and an actual whistleblower describing crash retrieval with bodies, with remains of a non-human classification. And he did not back down from that. And so I was I was rather proud of the fact that no matter how he was pushed, he did not you know, relinquish the position that the United States government has in its position, uh, his possession, actual, actual physical craft, wreckage, and bodies. Well, that's that's a summation of the Roswell incident, you know, 100%. And it's one of the reasons right now that the next phase as we are looking and as we will be meeting with growth men and then we are hoping to once again resume talks with Burchette's office that there would actually be Roswell hearings, that it would be myself and, and uh, Colonel Kevin Randall and my present partner, Thomas J. Carey, and where we could present all of our affidavits and our depositions and our deathbed testimonies, which are admissible in a court of law, because it's the one case that could blow this sky high, as you know, Todd. Because just yeah. imagine, just imagine a congressman like Tim Burchette just finally saying, show us the bodies. The yeah. man at the Pentagon showed them the bodies, and they could yeah. not deny it because then one by one they would be subpoenaed and they would have to lie under oath that there is no such thing. Okay, fine. If you want to risk perjuring yourselves, then go for it. And I want to just say something real quick, Don, for the the listeners, is that I I think a lot of people don't think about the oath part of this. You know, it's one thing to have a dinner table conversation or to tell your friend on the side something that you saw or were privy to, but to be under oath to Congress and to be put at risk of perjuring yourself, this mm-hmm. is a very, very serious thing. And I think, I don't think people realize, I think they're kind of lost on the idea of, of the importance of an oath and swearing under oath that you're going to tell the truth. And, uh, and, you know, this, you, you, you tend not to, uh, 
to want to be fibbing about anything in those situations where the dinner table conversation might be filled with a lot of uh, untruths or, you know, uh, armchair researchers saying the things that they say. But under oath, you're typically going to speak the truth because if you don't, you're in a lot of trouble. You're in a lot of trouble and you can face up to seven years in prison for each yeah. time that you may have lied under oath. And in this case, they could cite uh, dozens of times, all pertaining to crash retrieval, physical remains, and other information which would clearly demonstrate that we are dealing with an actual phenomenon that is not of an earthly origin. I love the fact that they got into even the possibility that we're dealing with something interdimensional. Well, that's precisely our position. The fact that it's something that is here, it slips in and out. Yeah. Uh, there's just too many experiences, too many sightings on a global basis. And let me, uh, I want to dig into this, what you're saying, Don. I want to, uh, but I want to ask a question before we get into this because AOC went live on Facebook the other day and I watched her speak. Um, but, uh, but I want to ask you a question first. Is it possible when I talked about the importance of a person being under oath? Is it possible that there would be people delivering misinformation and doing it under oath? Because as you know, in, in your course of investigating, there's been a lot of people that have seemed on the up and up, mm -hmm. have you had great stories that you really thought were there, and then years go by and you realize this person was just there to mislead me. They gave me a nugget and then took me off course. Yeah. Would a person do that under oath? Is this possible that these people are just patsies for something else? Well, well first of all, uh, just to uh, clarify matters, it wasn't a lot of people. It was maybe not even 5% of the 600 some witnesses we've interviewed. I could mm -hmm. probably count on one hand the number of people who we exposed, we exposed yeah. as um, essentially providing us misinformation. But there's a distinction between disinformation and misinformation. Misinformation is intentionally lying. You're spreading lies. But whereas disinformation, and you make a very, you make a valid point, Todd, and very few people have considered this. And when I first saw, uh, as far as Grush interviewed, and we presented his, his story, his information, I kept telling uh, other people in the media, this isn't a whistleblower by the definition of that very word, because he's not firsthand. He's repeating what others have told him. That's not a whistleblower. He can't prove anything. Now, I strongly suspect who a number of his sources are, who I am highly suspect of. And as a result, if all he is doing is repeating what he believes to be true, which turns out to be disinformation from other sources, then he is not perjuring himself. And that's where he is safe in that regard. But if it were uh, disinformation that he created, that he generated for whatever purpose. So his fallback is going to be, I'm only repeating what I was told. It's yeah. no different than I'm only following orders. I'm only doing what I was told. Right. And we know the, the military has a long history of plausible deniability. Right. Because that's, that's right. why it's set up that way. So yeah. they cannot get in trouble in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, I want to believe that the, you know, these people that gave their testimony had something important to say and that they're being truthful in their presentation of that. Um, but I'm always worried about people that are out to spread inf misinformation because there's a there's a difference in kind of a bullshit artist and someone who's purposely mm -hmm. trying to mislead you because of a certain agenda whatever that ag agenda might be and uh, yeah, you know that that's the only skepticism i have in this um i wanted to to move on i, I watched aoc do a, a 30 minute live stream on facebook the other day and um and you know i'm not a huge aoc fan um, but i, I do like some I do like some of the things that she says. Um, and I do like that, you know, she's really kind of, you know, an every man in a way. She went from being a, a bartender to a congresswoman. And, and I really admire that in a certain way because we've got someone real 
that's that's in politics, even if I don't necessarily believe a lot of what she believes. Um, mm -hmm. But she went into a lot of detail about her feelings on this uh, um, and why she sits on these oversight committees. And one of her biggest worries are these big um, Defense Department budgets yes. and how just a handful of vendors are getting the most amount of money from these contracts like Boeing and Lockheed Martin. Right. And she went down a list of, you know, four or five vendors that get all the money. And she said they're on these these contractors all the time trying to account for money they just they they don't seem to ever have to report what they're doing with the money um they're not really accountable to anyone their portions of these overall pentagon budgets are the biggest parts of the budgets not even counting what the military is has you know for its for you know for its its portion of the budget and she really was sort of talking about well how do we know this isn't just their experimental technology because mm -hmm. You know, well, they're developing things with this money, but it's not necessarily a military contract where we're going to deliver, right. you know, a hundred of these next mm -hmm. generation, you know, UFO fighters or whatever they might be, you know. Right. And so, like, so they're doing their own thing all the time with all of this government money. So I, she didn't say it in so many words, but it just made me wonder if, you know, not off planet stuff we're seeing here it's just experimental tech that no one's ever been mm -hmm. able to really see you know where where do you sit on this well and as you know whenever i hear of a recent sighting by today's terms i don't bat an eye as far as i'm concerned it's all our technology mm -hmm. uh, i mean i saw one of the most fantastic drone fourth of july shows down in Roswell at the annual festival. And it was just a clear demonstration that they could create a UFO invasion with nothing more than drones if they desired. But the difference is back in 47, when both jet and rocket propulsion were in their infancy, there was no satellite technology or wouldn't be for another 11 years skies were virgin skies were pristine and yet you had a technology that was clearly superior to anything that we had specifically russia was half destroyed from world war ii by the by nazi germany china would be a third world country for another 40 years uh we were it we were it and and the thought that we had anything that represented the level of, te of technology that was being observed, being described. And then the Roswell incident and the materials involved. What's interesting is just the other day, we heard the term that came out from one of the corporations, self-healing metal. Well, the irony in that the Roswell wreckage, and you can document, it's a matter of historic fact, it all went from Roswell to the predecessor of Area 51, which wouldn't come into existence for another eight years, but it was Wright Field, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, Foreign Technology Division, all the Nazi technology, all the Japanese technology. Whenever they recovered a Russian MiG, it would go to Wright Patterson in Dayton, Ohio, to uh, you know study it, analyze it, uh, reverse engineer it if there was any any technology to be gleaned as far as from their own aircraft, their own armory, weaponry at, at, at that time. And so the Roswell wreckage went the right path. The point being, whatever was developed as a result of their attempts to find the on button, so to speak. Here we are now, 76 years later, and as you've often heard me say, Todd, that they can't bridge that technology. It's that superior. It's almost supernatural. As uh, the famous scientist Arthur C. Clarke would suggest that we should expect that alien technology would almost be like magic. Like, my God, how did they do that? How can they do that? And I think that's one of the reasons that the Pentagon re remains as steadfast in their position 
that they're not about to roll over and concede anything because right. they above everybody else realize they're dealing with something that superior and they will never get a handle on it. It's not Will Smith and in Independence Day jumping into the cockpit and able to fly that thing like he's done it a hundred times before. And then when, when you, you also can you realize that the government slash the military, they don't manufacture anything, not a single plane, tank, ship, not a bullet. Everything is contracted out into the private sector. And lest we forget, President Dwight Eisenhower in his last speech before leaving the White House and his warning all of us about the growing threat, the growing power of the military industrial complex, military complex. Now, isn't it you know, interesting that unlike the FBI and unlike the CIA, unlike other branches of intelligence, including all the branches of the military, the one thing that is exempt from freedom of information are all the private corporations. So what a perfect hiding place. What a perfect smoke screen. That's why when the Pentagon, for example, you have um, uh, Sean Kirkpatrick, who has now been defending, he's the director of the All Domain Resolution Office, the AARO, Arrow, that is running all this through the Pentagon. And for him to say that we have absolutely no evidence, we have no technology that we have reverse engineered, we have no hardware, we have nothing. He may be telling the truth because it's all been assimilated into the private sector. Why would the Pentagon sit on it if they couldn't attempt to apply it militarily? Because that is their primary function. How can we make this into a new weapon? How can we make this into something that we can best our enemies with? That's their yeah. only prerogative, their only uh, purview in all this. And so we're, we're, we're going to see this debate now going back and forth. And that's where I feel we have to have our day in court because you're not going to get any from the Pentagon who's going to volunteer anything. They're going to plead yeah, yeah. national security. They're going to plead the fifth. And they're just going to basically say, we have no evidence. And they may be telling the truth by it because they've, they've turned it all over into the private sector. Yeah. Does the president have any influence in this? Can can Biden say, release everything you have? Well, we saw what became of the, uh, the John F. Kennedy files, that the intelligence, intelligence community, and in, in that case, it was specifically the CIA who convinced Trump to back off. And all again, all they have to do is plead national security. Yeah. And we can't expose, you know, we can't name our agents in the field and we can't identify our lookout posts. And, uh, and just like that, the president backs off. But, but you make a good point, Todd, in that, you know, I always bring up the fact that last time that former President Bill Clinton was on the Jimmy Kimmel show, this is all they talked about. And he went on and on, and he lamented the fact that he had eight years in the Oval Office and he couldn't get the truth about Roswell. So even Eisenhower, to bring up Eisenhower again, he was a five-star general. He was chief of staff of the Army in 1947 when Roswell happened. And in his own memoirs, he complained that after he became president, the Pentagon didn't tell him anything any longer. Yeah. Because they see you as a part-time job. They see it as somebody in four to eight years, they're walking the street. So they're not going to confide to you anything of a sense of nature because yeah. you don't have a need to know. Yeah. I think uh, Jimmy Carter asked about it too. Yeah. And at the time yeah. it was Bush senior was the head of the CIA. Was that, yes. is that right? I think that so. And, and he denied him, denied him, wouldn't, denied him. wouldn't turn anything yeah. over. It was about Roswell, wasn't it? Would did Carter want to know about Roswell? Well, Carter wanted to know. Carter had promised, uh, as a as a came, uh, as the campaign developed, and when he ran for president, he was going to release all the UFO files. Yo, if that's what it was. Uh, just the UFO yeah, files. Yeah, UFO files. And uh, what he he did do in 1977, he did declassify the Project Blue Book files, 
which was the most famous of the three Air Force investigations of the UFO phenomenon. But even there, they weren't intact. They weren't fully declassified. And the Air Force claimed it's all we have. And no, it's not, because, for example, they described uh, 21 gun camera cases. Well, the cases are there, but none of the gun camera film, none of the frames of, of footage that might actually show something. So they defied even the president in that case. So they, they, they have a long history. And then I like how even Kirkpatrick, and then even there was an official statement from the Pentagon that the, the Department of Defense is committed to timely and thorough reporting to Congress and, and, and being totally transparent on this subject and working with the American public as well and making sure that they're informed as to any new developments regarding UAPs, UFOs. Well, we know their track record is, is, is totally dismal and that for 76 years they've been deceiving and withholding information. We wouldn't be having hearings in Washington right now if it was just a matter of placing a phone call to the chair of the Joint Chiefs and uh, I want a full report by uh, you know, next Monday morning on uh, what evidence you have regarding this particular topic. Well, we have to have hearings because we have to get it from the horse's mouth. We have to get it from the actual witnesses involved. You know, lest we forget, when we worked with late Congressman Stephen Schiff of New Mexico in the early to mid 90s, and for all his failed efforts in trying to get information from the Pentagon on Roswell. And, uh, and I'll re I recall three letters that he sent to then Secretary of Defense Les Aspen, just asking him to open the files. He's Secretary of Defense. I want to see what you have on this one case. And they were totally ignored. So, so much for transparency. So yeah. much as far as for uh, thoroughly reporting on what they have. They're not. They never have. They never have. And that's another reason that um, I think Congress needs to finally say enough is enough. You've been lying to us for 76 years, and we've had enough. Can they, though? I mean, does it matter? It, it doesn't matter. Because, again, all the Pentagon has to do is plead ignorance. Why I, uh... the liability? All over I, you probably you probably heard me say this before. I talk about this all the time and piss off all my, my friends in entertainment. I always talk about how it doesn't matter what your favorite TV show is. The entertainment is the fodder between the commercials because yes. that's what the networks are for. They're, they yeah. just want to run ads. They don't care about Seinfeld. They don't care about Friends. They're they, happy yeah. if those shows become big hits because they can charge more for their ads. Even but make no mistake ads. about it. Yeah. They, will, they will make sure... That, that 22 minutes of entertainment ensures that you watch eight minutes worth of ads. Of ads. And correct. they'll space right. it out perfectly to where the ads aren't that intrusive to you and you go out and you buy their products. It's always about the commercials, right? It's not about the entertainment. And I feel like we're in a country that is a military country and the politics is just the fodder that's around mm -hmm. to kind of throw off suspicion mm -hmm. that you're actually living in a military society. <laughs> So I don't think that there will ever be any headway. The military runs the show. The military know, runs the show. Opinion. And the idea that the military is a complete dictatorship. Anyone who is... And so self-sufficient. Self completely self-sufficient. Self totally self-sufficient. And then they are able to also work within black operations. So they have carte blanche that they can you know, run up $100 toilet seats and $100 hammers as long as the bottom ledger adds up that they have unlimited funding and, and they can take uh, whatever resources they want they can take whatever resources they want and they can declare martial law and they can then become authority and law, rule of the land yeah as far as within a, a given situation and that again is totally against the constitution because that's what they they in their foresight they 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 sought to prevent the idea that the military could actually run the show, could actually yep. take charge of the government. They could. And uh, and again, I think it's a wonderful example of the fact that a former chair, as far as, a, as, far as a chief of staff of the Army and a five-star general, once he becomes president, he's out of the loop. That Eisenhower mm -hmm. actually complained they wouldn't 
tell him yep. anything any longer. Yep, because he was the people's champion at that point, and it doesn't matter if you're doesn't just matter. a servant of the people. You're just a, and the people are the fodder, right? We're in uh, charge. It's uh, it's fascinating. You know, I, I remember a doctor telling me one time. I, I said, and this was back when COVID was going on. And uh, I said, you know, this isn't really like it was bad. I was in New York when COVID hit. So, it was, you know, I was in the episode. Mm -hmm. You were in ground zero. Yeah. Ground zero. Yeah. And um, yeah. and uh, uh, and I remember saying, you know, this is bad. But like, what if it was like a really bad thing? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he just told me, he said, self-preservation comes to mind. And I go, yeah. what? he goes, I'm not going to work. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I was like, what? Yeah. You want to believe that like your emergency room people are going to show up for work and that, you know, cops are going to go, you know, every man for himself. Their duty. That, They're gone. And that but be, the one institution that won't do that will be the military. With the military, that they yeah. would then step in and totally take charge. And that shows you who's really running the show, you know, yes. right there. Yeah. That speaks volumes. Uh, I, I mean, the idea that even a president, I mean, we, we saw it as far as with, in different situations, even in Washington, D.C., that well, we can all we can go all the way back as far as even the Kennedy assassination, and it's one of the things that was part of the the Warren report. The idea that somebody told the military to back down, that they were not patrolling the streets as they should have been, and they took it as far as as essentially they're washing their hands of being held accountable for allowing the president to be assassinated. So it, it can go both ways. That if they can, you know back out of a situation and not then have any uh, accountability, they're happy to do that. But if they have to step in and take charge, they're the first ones that come in with the tanks down Main Street. And it's like, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you are to stay in your homes. You are not to come out of your homes until we give you permission. And essentially, yeah, it's every person for themselves. And it's it, it's when you really think about yeah. the idea that our military would have such power. Well, who gave it? And to we've them? seen we've seen that in certain ways with the National Guard. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, the National Guard's the state's militia, but it's all really the military. <laughs> well, we saw it. We saw like with the the the, the Boston Marathon, uh, yeah. the two brothers, the the bombers, and the fact that they had already accounted for the one brother and just for searching for one individual. I mean, there isn't a given night that in any one city they're not trying to find a hundred suspects to some of the most heinous crimes within a community, within a city. And yet they declared martial law. They shut down the entire city of Boston just to look for one individual. Yep. And to me, it was a trial balloon. It was to see if the people would comply, if the people yep. would give it. And they did, 100%. And it and it's not just there, too. You know, in uh, New York, when COVID broke out, Westchester, which was kind of the first cases, mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. military. Shut it down. Couldn't get off the subway there. You couldn't go into the town. Nothing. And we saw it, you know, with the L.A. riots. They came in there. And they shut They shut all that down, all that part of L.A. where the, the L.A. riots were going on. So it, it's happened. Once a decade, we, we see it. that happen. And we saw it with Roswell in 1947, where the military took charge where the yeah. military did not even declare martial law because they had to abide by the second explanation that it was nothing more than a weather balloon device. Well, you can hardly declare martial law, <laughs> you know, take charge of the streets over a damn weather balloon. But yeah. nonetheless, they still uh, took authority. They, it, they, they roughed up the local sheriff. I mean, they, took, they, they went into the sheriff's yeah. office and manhandled him. Just to retrieve some of the wreckage that he took into his possession uh, from the crash let, site. Let me ask you, Don, because uh, I've never known this, and you, maybe you can enlighten me on it. When we were there for the the first for the Sci Fi Channel dig, that land was Bureau of Land Management land, mm -hmm. right? right? It wasn't any private property at all. It was just government land, and then Our ranchers were property. leasing right. it to. Okay, but back in back in 47 who owned the land then was it owned by people was it just the county there because there was no bureau of land management then right or was there there was but it was under a different title at that time it was still through uh the uh, the, the, the treasury department as far as uh, the, uh, the leasing off of private property for conservation purposes 
And in, in, in that case, it was still a, a, a cattle and sheep ranch. It was 75,000 acres and about 25,000 of those acres were government owned land leased back to, it was a J.B. Foster. He was the owner of the, of the gotcha. ranch at that time. Uh, so nothing nefarious about that, but the idea that they still commandeered the ranch. Right. They still set up a base of operation at the ranch house. They yeah. still prevented anybody from coming onto the ranch to even sure. tend to the horses who were penned, who could not fend for themselves out on the open range. They needed to be watered. They needed to be feed, uh, fed. And uh, again, the military showing that if we, as far as uh, you know, actually take charge of your property, you can't stop us. So the military could go into the, the military could go into Yellowstone. They could go into a national park, a forestry, anywhere they want at any time. Or does this require any kind of governmental approval? Do you know? All the military would have to do is declare some state of emergency that say Yellowstone. Oh, we have reason to believe that, uh, you know, the, the the, the Yellowstone, the, the geyser is going to, you know, explode. That they're yeah. that they're, we're pick, they're picking up seismic readings that something is about to happen. They could do it. I mean, the, a great example is the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where at Devil's Tower they staged as far as uh, that there had been some uh, contaminant, some chemical right. spill, and all the right. animals yeah. were, were 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 dying as a result. And so we have to, you know, restrict. We have to cordon off the area. And that's all they have to do. They could come up. And in fact, they could create a chemical spill. They could do, do mm -hmm. most anything. They would have the resources to create, you know, whatever the natural disaster necessary. And right. they could, as a result, commandeer an entire city if they needed to. Yes. Yes. Let me ask you this. I know we're getting close to kind of the time that we wanted to do tonight. Um, now that these hearings are over, what should we expect from the public? Are people, are there more believers now than ever before? Are there more skeptics than ever before? Obviously, you're doing a ton of interviews. What, mm -hmm. What's the public going to get out of this? Well, uh, first of all, our, our, our hope is that the hearings will not be open or over, that this will be just the first uh, you know, phase. And they're talking about even additional whistleblowers that are at the ready that are willing to testify. And then, as I mentioned, our own efforts that we're going to now push for actual hearings on the Roswell incident, because we can go right to the very beginning when, you know, we had whistleblowers who could actually describe handling wreckage, handling non-human bodies, that type of thing. Now, how convenient, as I, I've been pointing out, that they're all gone, that now we have hearings, you know. 15 years ago, we could have provided them 100 first-hand yeah. witnesses. No, well, how utterly convenient. But we're the next best thing because we have all those testimonies on tape, on audio tape, on videotape. Their depositions, their their sworn affidavits. So it's the next best thing. Right. And so that's where we're going to be pushing, and we've been assured both by Burchette's office and by Grothman's office that there will be additional hearings forthcoming. And we, we want to be part of that. Uh, we're way beyond just being bench warmers on the sidelines. Uh, we demand our day in court. And uh, it's an opportunity we may never have again. And that's where we have to now step up. And I know Kevin Randall is with me 100% as well as, as Tom Carey. And so uh, and we can bring them all the families they would like as well who have lived in fear and intimidation, where the military, again, exhorting, you know, the worst levels of fear and intimidation to even children. That was the military that did that, where they yeah. went into people's homes and said, we will kill your children if you ever talk about this again. My God, who gave them that power and authority? Yeah, yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson, of course, you know, kind of crapped on all of this. <laughs> and he says, he says, uh, we have a telescope that can see to the beginnings of the universe, but we still have the worst quality video and pictures of UFOs. 
So he says, I well, just can't believe that it's real. And what if it is interdimensional? It's right mm -hmm. on our noses. It's right here yeah. around us. So yeah. We're not going to, I mean, it's like we're, we're, we're peering out in the space when it's right here. It's like, well, step away from the telescope for a moment and maybe you would notice that there's something yeah. going on, you know, right in our midst. So uh, he's, you know, he's a government hack as well. And I'm, I, yeah. I, I probably say that because, um, you know, with him, it's, it's a case of the next government grant, the next government funding for whatever pre preconceived right. projects they have. Um, they need yeah. to uh, also step up. If it's, if it's, if it's enough of a dilemma for the Pentagon to keep secret for 76 years, there's a reason there's something there. There's a lot of fire behind that smoke. And it's about time the scientific community stops selling their souls to the devil, so to speak, just for the sake of getting that next grant. Yeah, for sure. I'm going to stick with the, uh, the my normal uh, stream of consciousness with this, and that is just, it's, it's more swamp gas than we've ever mm -hmm. had before. Mm -hmm. That's what people, that's what they're experiencing. There's swamp yeah. gas. I think it's toxic mold in your houses. No. Um, you know, ductwork not cleaned out. You're seeing things. You haven't cleaned your glasses. I'm going to go with all the skeptic stuff here, Don. That... <laughs> and, that's what, and, and what's interesting is that's what is receiving a lot of the traction right now. Hmm. And I, I, for one, have often said they could trot out a non-human body in a cake of ice tomorrow. And half yeah. the people still would disbelieve it. They would, yeah. We live sure. in a CGI world. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we have to constantly caveat enter the idea that uh, you can't even believe what your lying eyes well, are, are telling you any longer. You, you remember the great uh, sci fi channel show, The Alien Autopsy? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I know. And well, they've got Stan Winston on there saying, I don't know how this could be in effect. This is so good. And it's like well, people are buying all this, you know. But we didn't buy it. <laughs> we were on to it from the very beginning. We exposed oh, it. Boy. And we were very outspoken about. And we have made mistakes. We have, you know, whether it was the so-called slides that uh, depicted an alien body. And it turned out to be a mummified uh, Native American boy, that type of thing. Uh, the slides were doctored. They were, uh, you, you know, they were changed to make it appear as though it was alien, that type of thing. And but you still have to check everything out. That's the thing about yeah. that subject, because for lack of hard evidence, for lack of uh, anything concrete that we can then satisfy our own quest in solving the mystery, we still have to check out every lead and. Yeah, the date they they've all you know proven <laughs> short of the the prize, the brass ring, so to speak. But nonetheless, at least we're willing to take that chance. We're willing to go out on a limb and uh, perform due diligence with the hope that one of these times, it's only going to take one time that we finally you know crack crack the code, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Don, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, this evening to uh, do this special episode. It's always fun. I miss doing these. Um, and I'm curious, did you go see the new Barbie movie? I mean, uh, the Oppenheimer movie? <laughs> <laughs> you weren't supposed to say anything. No. I, 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 in fact, I'll be seeing uh, Oppenheimer uh, this coming week. And uh, I, I love the fact that I'm a, a student of the Manhattan Project. I'm a student of uh, many of the particulars the people who were involved and you and i had the wonderful good fortune of uh you know knowing very well the late chester lido senior who yes. was very involved working both at zenith and motorola in chicago at that time and how they were involved with the project and then specifically with the radio <laughs> detonator the transmitter for yeah. detonating the bomb as far as from an aerial altitude so um I, I I'll be able to pick up and see things that I'll go. Wait a minute, that's not what uh, that's not the truth here, or that's revising history. So it's an yeah. advantage to, that both of us will have. I expect there will be a lot of revisionist history in this. Yeah, 
they'll take some liberties and that's sure. a, a, that's unfortunate because it's just like with roswell uh why do you need to exaggerate why do you need to embellish why do you need to change anything you know history especially of the the most elemental events throughout the course of uh, humankind that we would need to change anything i know hollywood always will take liberty but we don't need to revise we don't need to try to skew events for political purposes and I mean, unfortunately yeah. that has bec that hollywood has been as political as washington for many decades now well, you know, it, it's in, entertainment always shifts. They take their own perspective on things anyways. You know, you see anything you see that's a period piece now, you won't see as, you know, it, it won't be accurately depicted anymore. So you'll see a lot of um, ethnicities that you wouldn't have seen at a particular mm -hmm. time or place. You won't see people smoking cigarettes like they would have smoked back in that day. Ashtray cigarettes uh, mm -hmm. missing from so much period piece entertainment that's, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Like that's all removed, you know, just the way the culture even looked then. Uh, I know. Is, uh, well, is changed and sterilized. It's like we saw a, 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 a yearly production but uh, it was the first time it happened of uh, Dickens Christmas Carol and uh, Bob Cratchit, his family was interracial. And it's like, well, okay. I mean, <laughs> that's not how it was written, but yeah. It makes well, it all, Snow White, all inclusive. Snow White, the seven dwarves aren't going to be dwarves in the new movie. So <laughs> no, <it probably> won't <laughs> be. <laughs> that's what's messed up. You know, uh, I wanted to say, we were talking about Chet, and um and you know you and i had you know many times we spent with chet and i did uh as well with nina and yeah. was privy to a lot of interesting conversations with him and you know the interesting thing about chet was he was so pro-nuclear yes he oh, totally, totally. was all about the nuclear program even seeing him in the late 90s when i did he was still very we need these nuclear totally. weapons we need them and i'm actually exactly the opposite i think we need to go door to door and get these things off planet earth mm -hmm. and i went to see um the the last guardians of the galaxy movie with my nephew who's 10 years okay. old and that one of the trailers before guardians of the galaxy was oppenheimer and of course you know they're you know doing their intensive trailer and that you see the nuclear explosion the chain reaction you see all this stuff and he turns to me and he says, what is this? And I said, it's the atomic bomb. And he goes, what is that? And I mean, no one really alive today, very few people alive today were around when those bombs were detonated. So right. no one really understands the power of just the yeah. atom bomb, which doesn't even exist anymore. Like that was like nothing compared to what we have now. Well, compared to and, the um, we have, uh, 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 oh my God. Yeah. And uh, 50 yeah. mile radius right now. My God. And I was oh. like, this kid's 10, but he has no concept of what this is at all. You know, and I thought this is nuts because one of the most effective powers the government can have is to get all of the memory of that out of your, yeah. out of your system, you know, right. have enough generations go by where no one really remembers or understands the destruction. So keep making the weapon, you know? So in your, in your nephew's case, he's 10. Yeah. This this happened. I was lecturing uh, on a college campus. I don't know if it was the University of uh, Illinois in Chicago or where, but about 15 minutes because I was talking about the Manhattan Project and I was setting it all up. And then many of the personnel who were then stationed at Roswell, and it was the first atomic bomb squadron at that time, the 509 bomb wing. And I'm giving the background, the history. And it hits me that these college students have no idea what I'm talking about. Yep. The entire development, the birth of the atomic age, the entire as far as ending of World War II with the dropping of two, they had no idea. These are college kids. And it was frightening. It was frightening. You know, all that time was spent with Chet back then was pre-9-11. Correct. And um, and I wrote about this in my Metatomics book, which you have a copy of. I don't know yes. if you've ever gotten through it or not, but there's a part of the book yeah, yeah. that I talk about 
that to put into perspective the the original atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb if you were to detonate an a bomb in new york city it would take out a borough that means that manhattan would be gone or mm-hmm. brooklyn would be gone right no cleanup nothing you know there's no vaporized saving anything there might as well build a wall around it right right we don't even have that bomb anymore no no the no. hydrogen bomb takes out all five boroughs yes yes and i put like into 50, perspective 50 mile radius 50 mile radius I, I put into perspective in the book that when the trade centers came down which were two skyscrapers uh-huh. and a couple of uh-huh. buildings that were around it it took six months to clean that up yes that yes. was two skyscrapers right. you wouldn't have any kind of rescue effort you would have no cleanup effort there would be no, no rebuilding if that happened that's right. and i think right. people have to hear it in those terms to really understand what it can do so anyways my two cents there. i know we gotta wrap up at least this movie as highly critiqued reviewed as it is that it will draw enough people and what it needs to do is draw enough teachers that then will start conveying this to their students uh, lest yeah. we forget and you are absolutely correct todd we have generations now of young people who have not been taught any of this and that's mm-hmm. why we could you know easily you know you know you know fall into world war three simply for out of ignorance of the fact that they have no concept is they, they, they think that oh it's just something that we could survive it's just something that uh, uh we would get over just like 9 11. and that would be to, to me the greatest tragedy of all the idea that as society has been dumbed down more and more that yeah. part of that is also what we would face as far as within another world war the idea yeah. that as, as even einstein said that the fourth world war will be fought with sticks and stones yeah that's, all <laughs> left. that's right after the third war that will be yeah oh man um Oliver Stone said the other day that he thinks that Biden could lead us into World War III, that this toying around with Russia is not a joke. And of course, you know, Oliver Stone is deep into conspiracy theories. And mm-hmm. he mm-hmm. says the he goes back and he talks about um, the, the U.S.'s influence in Ukraine for a long time, yeah. uh, particularly in their last election yes. and sort of that coup that happened. And um and that they've been in there that there's a lot of cold war people that are around biden that are still you know that's what they were they were the the cold war era people and they don't they they're not done with this yet no and that this this pushing and pushing and pushing and slowly sliding more weapons and more people and more things into ukraine is one day just going to piss off russia and that uh his he has a real worry and he says he voted for biden and he realizes how big of a mistake it was now right right and uh he says I mean, he thinks like, how that, long that, can you keep provoking the bear how long can you keep poking them with a stick before they finally bite your hand off yeah and it's like why again young people need to start marching in the streets not protesting about their student loans about their futures about their very survival and again they're, they're not taught any history yeah for sure that's for a reason because this way they won't recognize it. They won't see it when it comes. Yeah. Well, Don, thanks for coming out today. I'm going to do the close real quick here. Um, no Earthly Explanation. We're out there on all social medias. Find us at No Earthly Explanation. You can get our podcast anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Uh, so I believe since our last episode, we're now on Pandora and uh, in Sirius XM Radio. So you can get us there on satellite now, too. So we're out in outer space right now broadcasting, Don. And uh, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. if you have any questions, <laughs> right, that's right. <laughs> we are. They're out there listening to us right now. Um, right now. And, and of course, if you want to send us an email, no earthly explanation at gmail.com. And uh, Donna, I hope we can get a couple more special episodes in. Maybe we'll do a review on Oppenheimer. Who knows? And yes, then uh, yes, we'll yeah. see about a season three still. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's always great to be with you, Todd, do anything with you. And I know I can always count on you. So uh, I, I, I know we, we try to be thought provoking, but I think 
the main thing is we try to be truthful, honest with the audience and uh, thought provoking enough that they go and find out for themselves. And I think uh, as we've you know, demonstrated by even going out just by seeing a movie that you raise, that you ask questions, you just don't accept it as, uh, as gospel any longer. You, yeah. you, you question what uh, the agenda may be behind you know, the, the, the feature you just uh, witnessed. And so the same with the hearings that are happening in Washington, that we question whose ox is being gored and, and, and whose, whose agenda is served by a continuing cover-up. Right. And so the smartest people in the room are always the ones who ask the most questions. That's right. Keep asking. That's right. Keep asking. All right, Don. Okay. Thanks for coming out, and we'll talk soon, okay? Look forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, bye bye. Goodbye. Hi, everyone. I'm Todd Fisher, the host of the Cult Following Podcast. Cult Following is a podcast that studies the personalities and common traits of cult leaders and their followers get the real story behind these infamous and oftentimes tragic cults from a new perspective through exhaustive research and from interviews with people that were there available anywhere you listen to podcasts thank you for listening to this podcast please be sure to rate and review this episode this podcast is produced by todd fisher and anthony smith and is distributed by metacortex publishing this podcast is copyright any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions stated in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Please be sure and visit the official website for Metacortex Publishing at metacortexpublishing.com or find us on social media for other unique content.